you will hear a telephone conversation between a woman and the secretary of a cycling club. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 10. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 10. Cuxford Cycle Club? Oh, yes. Hello. I'm calling to inquire about joining the club. Fine. What would you like to know? Well, I wanted to get a picture of what the club is like. For example, how big it is? Now, that changes each year, of course. Cycling is growing in popularity. I'm sure. So, last year we had nearly 70 members, which was a record in itself. But this year, there are 76 people on the list, and I'd say at least 60 of them come to events regularly. I should think something like 85 is a likely figure by next year. That's bigger than I expected. Yes, there are plenty of opportunities to meet people. And how much does it cost to join? It depends. £40 is for standard members, and there are reductions for certain categories. For example, veteran and youth members pay £10 less, £30. And family membership works out at £25 per head. All those charges are per year. And youth means? Under 18. Oh, that covers me, at least at the moment. <laughs> then, for safety reasons, your application will need to be endorsed, so your teacher or parent needs to sign your form. No problem. So, what happens after I've sent the form in to you? We deal with it and get a confirmation of acceptance with a membership card out to you in three weeks, and then you're ready to ride. It lasts a year, and we send you a renewal one month before it's due to expire. OK. And can you tell me something about the activities you do? Yes, there's a range of things to reflect the varied membership. There are the family rides, which are pretty popular, held every month, and that might get increased to every two weeks. I don't know if that's really for me. Hmm. You might prefer the Saturday rides, which are more popular with the youth members. We don't go huge distances, 100 kilometres or anything like that. 60 kilometres is about average but the pace is fairly brisk. Let's hope I'll be able to keep up. <laughs> oh, actually, there's something I should have mentioned before. We've got to be sure everyone's bike is roadworthy, so you'll need to have your bike checked and obtain a safety certificate for it. Most bike shops will do that for you. Fine. Do you do any longer tours, like holidays? Yes. There's a camping tour at least twice a year. There's one on July the 14th, though it'll get booked up very soon. If you miss that, then there's another on August the 17th. Oh, good. But obviously there's plenty going on before then. You might want to come along on May the 5th. Your membership should be through by then, and that's when we have a picnic. Everyone brings some food to share, and we go out to the hills and eat there. That sounds fun. I'm going to fill in my form as soon as I get off the phone. And a further benefit of membership is the discount with wheels. The shop on Mill Road? Yes, the manager's a member of the club and he'll give you a 15% reduction. It means membership can pay for itself. Great. Well, you'll be getting my form soon. Good. I look forward to meeting you. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. 
You will hear part of a local radio program in which the head of the Park Arts Center is interviewed about events that are going to be held at the center. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 20. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 11 to 20. And next on City Life This Week, we have with us in the studio Harvey Bowles, head of the Park Arts Centre. He's here to tell us about forthcoming events at the centre. Harvey, welcome. Hello, thank you. So, what can we look forward to first at the Park Centre? We've got a very exciting programme lined up for you. The next event will start on the 18th of February and run till the 24th. Times for the event? Twice each day at 2.30 and 7.30pm. There'll be a folk music concert and uh, we're sure this is going to be very popular. A range of excellent musicians are coming, uh, some playing for the first time in this country. And for those who want a souvenir, or for people who don't manage to get to the performances... The foyer shop will be selling a CD showcasing the great talents of the performers. Sounds good. <laughs> yes. And then after that, our next event is starting on the 1st of March and runs for eight days. There's a lot going on, so you'll need to look in the separate programme, which shows all the various times and so on. It also includes details of performers and ticket prices. You can pick one up from the foyer at the centre. Yes, this year we're hosting the Dance Festival again, and it's going to be even bigger than last year. It's become a major feature of the arts year, and many of the performances will be recorded on video and DVD. But uh, nothing can beat the thrill of attending the events live. We have a great range of styles, performed by over a hundred groups, representing as many as four continents. All I can say is book early because many of the shows are going to sell out quickly. I'm sure they will. And what do you have for us after that? Well, uh, then things get a little quieter, but no less interesting. From the 14th to the 20th of March, every evening at 8, we go into cinema mode and we're showing a fine new film. I expect you've seen reviews of it. Love and Hope. Oh, yes, wonderful. Yes, and it's not just an ordinary screening. We're delighted that each screening will be introduced by a short lecture by the producer, who will also leave a little time for questions from the audience. Again, I recommend early booking for this. It's bound to be popular. I'll be there. <laughs> Anything else lined up at this point? Yes, we've got a special one-day event on April the 2nd. The times aren't fixed yet, but I can tell you that we're having a singing competition. Oh, yes? <laughs> There'll be a large number of entrants, and the talent should be impressive. And Channel 6 are coming, so the event is going to be shown on TV. So, come and be part of the audience. I'm sure people will want to. Well, Harvey, thank you very much for coming in and telling us all this. Details of all the events are on your website, aren't they? Yes, yes. The address is www. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 3. Section 3. You will hear three students, Ben, Jane, and Tom, having a discussion about their architecture and design studies course.
First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. So, Tom, did you manage to get all your reading done? Yes, Ben, I did. What about you, Jane? Me too, though it took much longer than I thought it would. Yeah, some of those dissertations are really long, aren't they? Mm. Mm. I'm not looking forward to having to write mine. Well, that's not till next year. So, shall we compare thoughts about our reading? Hmm. Let's start with 20th century architecture. I thought it was pretty impressive. There was quite a bit of detail. Yeah, all very relevant. I enjoyed the pictures, the diagrams and photos. Mm, they were quite strange. Not what you'd expect to find in a dissertation, mm. but very helpful. Whereas sometimes I couldn't really follow the arguments. Yes, a bit of a mixed bag, really. While modern construction was very serious and thorough, wasn't it? Indeed. Actually, it was rather dense. I didn't find it particularly easy to read either. The index was excellent, though, so I used that to guide me around. I still think it was a bit high level. I certainly wouldn't have wanted to try and cope with it in the first year. No. That's not who it's aimed at, of course. Mm. What about steel, glass and concrete? Not the world's most interesting title, of course. <laughs> Again, the index was helpful. Though I think we could have done with more photos. There weren't really enough to support what he was saying in places. Yeah. But what he was saying was easy to follow, wasn't it? He takes you through step by step. It was hard to believe it had been translated. It seemed very natural. Mm. Actually, it was better written than the next one. The space we make. But we're supposed to be thinking about architectural ideas, not being literary critics. <laughs> I like that one. Really? I just didn't think it covered the whole situation. Mm. It didn't put the question of housing into the context of the time. You mean how in the 50s economic austerity limited the finances available while a growing population needed housing quickly? Exactly. Again, I think you're asking too much of these dissertations. Mm, perhaps you're right. Well, I did like change and tradition, anyway. Very focused. Yes, although I did think it was oddly arranged in some ways. When you went to the index to track something down, you couldn't necessarily find what you wanted. I know what you mean. But I have to say, I'd be very proud if I'd written any of these. True. <laughs> and you will next year. Now you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the conversation and answer questions 26 to 30. Never mind next year. It's this year that's the problem. I'm never going to get this assignment done. Yes, you are. Come on, let's make a plan for you. Oh, please. I'm just not sure where to go from here. I could look at city plans, study the layout of housing developments. I think you need a closer focus. The approach to small houses won't necessarily tell you what you want to know. You'd be better to concentrate on large private houses. Study the drawings of those. OK. Though I don't know how much useful detail I'll be able to get from the kinds of plans that are easily available from that period. Mm, it's true. They can be limited. Mm. But what you could do as a next stage is go onto the web. There's loads of useful stuff there. More detailed plans, you mean? Well, I was thinking more of illustrations, that kind of thing. Do a search for window designs. I'm sure you'll find some good ones. I agree. And not just online. See what you do find there, and then, for your next step, check both campus libraries. I think you'll be able to get hold of books which will give you further information. And you need to know more about typical furniture of the time. This is all very helpful. Thanks, guys. I'm beginning to think I should be able to get something done for Dr Forbes after all. 
At least I can see I'll be in a position to tell him the section headings. Well, a bit more than that would be better. Put your outline plan together and give him that to look at. Hmm. Yes. But I'll still need to keep reading, won't I? Yeah. <laughs> Once Doctor Forbes has okayed what you've done at that point, you could then go and see Doctor Gray. He's very approachable, and I'm sure he'd be happy to provide you with further references. And then you could take it from there. That'd be really useful. Well, thanks again. Let me get you both another coffee. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear part of a lecture about the early history of cinema. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen to the lecture, and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Now we all take the wonders of the cinema very much for granted these days, but cinema really is a very recent phenomenon. It has moved from its origins in the simple still camera to the dazzling computer-generated graphics of today in little over a hundred years. Perhaps the real beginning of cinema. Was the cinematograph, a moving camera invented by the Lumiere brothers? As the excitement at the early screenings of short, simple moving pictures spread, competition developed rapidly, and soon cameras such as the American Biograph were on the market. Advertisements asserted that the Biograph did not shake as much as the cinematograph. Meanwhile, permits were acquired for outside filming. And import licenses were difficult to obtain for equipment, and there were other difficulties for cameramen. When the Lumiere brothers went to film the crowning of Tsar Nicholas II in Russia in 1896, the camera's ticking noise led people to believe it was a bomb. Although this confusion was resolved, disaster struck at the ceremony when a stand of spectators collapsed and the huge crowd panicked. The cameramen kept filming. It was the first time such events had been filmed, and this marked the beginning of a new concept of journalism. Well, the technology continued to develop rapidly, and often secretly. The thrill of invention and the prospect of riches to be made drove experimenters along, but historians of cinema face difficulties in establishing if an apparatus functioned in the way that its makers asserted. Everyone was keen to say that their machine was the best. Of course, in some cases, however, we do have reliable records or evidence in the equipment itself, and then we can see the details of the evolution of the technology. By about 1890, for example, the Frenchman Marais had arrived at results of startling clarity in sequential images. He also had the idea of recording images on a long strip of paper that unrolled in front of the lens instead of on separate plates, but he found it impossible initially to ensure that this strip would have regular movement. As we step into the twentieth century, however, we see much progress has been made, and there are many examples of what we would today recognise as films. Questions of the art form were now as important as questions of what was technologically possible, and filmmakers searched around for ideas to draw on.
comic strips were very popular at the time in newspapers, and their structure was applied to the planning of films, which were now being mapped in a series of picture panels. Different innovations were achieved by different types of filmmaker, with a certain amount of rivalry between makers of documentaries and makers of fiction films. One area where documentaries led the way was in the use of travelling shots, although of course fiction films adopted this technique in due course. Various sources for stories were developing, and each would have an impact on the way the story was filmed. For example, filmmakers started to use greater numbers of shots when chase films became popular, because they wanted to show the various stages of the policeman running after the bandit and so on. And it wasn't just different kinds of story that were driving filmmakers to think up new techniques. Other technology also played its part. The telephone was growing in use, and filmmakers came up with the idea of splitting the screen image into two parts to show telephone conversations. All this growing sophistication in the shooting of films began to make the whole process of creating them more challenging. The very first films consisted of single shots and were straightforward to take from shooting to showing them to audiences. However, as the filming developed into multiple shots, then editing emerged as an essential ingredient of the process. Cinema was growing up. Well, next I'd like to turn your attention to some of the issues that I believe were. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.